Cold Creek March. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome back to the second half. That was the Cold Creek March, and I was somewhere back in the 80s, I had to give a banjo lesson to somebody, and they wanted to learn the Cold Creek March, and I had it on a recording, but I didn't know exactly how it was supposed to be played. If you would go down on the first string, or across the strings this way, and uh, I knew that Pete Seeger played it, so I called up Pete and said, hey Pete, can you... Uh, demonstrate to me or tell me how you play Cold Creek March. And uh, he said, well sure, you uh, go down you go down on the first string. And I said, great Pete, that's all I needed to know. And he said, well you know I've got it all tabbed out in tab banjo tablets or I could fax it to you. And somehow Pete Seeger with a fax machine in the 80s it just, what? But uh, he had a fax machine, and so I said, well, great, and my lesson's coming in an hour. And he said, no problem, I'll just send it right out right now. So five minutes goes by, 15 minutes, half an hour, 45 minutes, no tablature from Pete. Finally, about five minutes before the lesson, the tablature shows up, and I look at it, and indeed, it's all right there. There's a little note at the top that says, Dear Tony, uh, I couldn't find the tablature, so I had to write the whole thing over again by hand. <laughs> Exclamation mark, Pete. Oh, sorry, Pete. So, anyway, so that was note for note the version that Pete sent me that you just heard right there. Okay. So, flashback about a half century earlier when Pete was a teenager and he was very frustrated because he had a plectrum banjo and he couldn't figure out how to play the banjo music he heard on the field recordings of John and Alan Lomax. So his father, Charles, suggested a road trip south to a fiddle festival in North Carolina. In the summer of 1936, at the height of the Depression, they drive through Appalachia to the American Folk Song and Dance Festival in Asheville. There, Seeger sees the five-string banjo played for the first time. A spry older woman in a rocking chair with flowers painted on her banjo, Samantha Bumgarner, playing claw hammer style, also known as frailing. In 1924, Aunt Samantha became the first Appalachian banjo player of either sex to cut a commercial record.
The symbolic connection between the banjo, the people who played it, and the songs they played left a lasting impression. Pete Seeger became a minstrel with a mission. In his hands, the five-string banjo took on new meanings and new uses, a metaphor for the rural working class and a tool for expressing the plight of the underdog. In 1948, he wrote a pioneering banjo manual and later in the 50s followed it with an instructional LP and even a 16 millimeter film loop. During the 1950s, when Pete was blacklisted and fighting imprisonment, he spread his message by playing in schoolhouses, colleges, and summer camps. His banjo manual was part of that message. For a generation of Northerners growing up in the 50s, Pete's homemade manual was an open sesame to a new world of cultural possibilities. Pete told me in an interview that it was the most important thing I ever did in my life was in the 50s. I could have kicked the bucket in 1960 and my main work on this world would have been done. I showed a whole batch of people the songs of Woody Guthrie and Lead Belly. There's a lot of great music in this country that you hardly ever hear on the radio. I'm going to play a tune for you right now that um, I learned from Pete about three months ago when he was 94. He's 94 now. And uh, I was backstage with him doing a show and I just asked him to play this tune that I heard him play earlier. And uh, it's basically called It's Always Dark Before the Dawn. And so uh, I recorded him playing it and transcribed it. So this is some more note for note Pete from about three months ago and at the age of 94. And it's just amazing. He still has that touch, that beautiful touch. And it's a beautiful tune. Always dark before the dawn. when I was first getting into the banjo, <clears throat> um, I grew up uh, listening to uh, Pete Seeger with the, the Weavers and the Almanac Singers and solo. I was uh, what you would call a red diaper baby, I suppose. And um, my parents were fairly left oriented. And so um, at the age of 14, when I first started getting into the banjo and I had Pete's book, I wrote Pete a postcard. Uh, sort of like writing a letter to Santa Claus, Pete Seeger, Beacon, New York. And it got there, and within about, and I was kind of gushing about how Pete, you're the greatest banjo player who ever lived in the world. And uh, again, within about two weeks, I get a postcard back, and it says, "Dear Tony, banjo playing is not like a horse race. There's no such thing as best. But I'm glad you like my banjo playing." Signed, Pete Seeger, and he wrote, drew his little banjo in there. So, um, Pete Seeger's been a big part of my life all the way through. And I'd like to do one of my favorite of his tunes right now, at least in terms of the instrumental end of things, because you think a lot of times about Pete Seeger going, which is great, that strumming sort of thing, or you think about this sort of a thing. What he calls the basic strum. 
But Pete Seeger is still one of the most amazing banjo players ever. Uh, he recorded an album in 1955 called The Goofing Off Suite, and it was tunes that came up, uh, he, he came up with, he had just bought a house and property in Beacon, New York, overlooking the Hudson River, and uh, he and his to wife Toshi had bought it. And while Toshi was putting in the electrical system and his kids were tarring the driveway, Pete was hanging out in the hammock, noodling on the banjo, or so he told me, and the tunes that he was noodling with became the Goofing Off Suite. And one of the tunes in there is a tune called Blue Skies by Irving Berlin. And uh, this is note for note or as close as I get, could get it to the way Pete played it on the Goofing Off Suite in 1955. He was way ahead of his time and as I mentioned I saw him about three months ago and I asked him if he still played it and he did and he played it and it was just about like I'm going to play it for you now. And again that's at the age of 94 so Blue Skies. from where Pete first saw a five-string banjo played frailing style. At about the same time, there was a boy living on a farm in Shelby, North Carolina, trying out a very different way of picking the banjo. He used three fingers, up-picking like the classic banjo players, but he had a rolling syncopated drive all his own. Scruggs never claimed to have invented the three-finger style. There were lots of banjo pickers in the Carolinas who had developed some variation on it. Locally, Earl recalled a blind banjoist named Mac Woolbright who played a song called, The Man Who Wrote Home Sweet Home Never Was a Married Man. 
And now here's how Mac Woolbright played it. This is what the young Earl Scruggs heard around 1930. was the youngest in a large family where his brothers and sisters all played musical instruments. Fiddle, guitar, auto harp, and banjo. Earl's father used to play the banjo to wake up his kids, but he died when Earl was only four. The way Earl told it, the three-finger style came to him in the bat of an eye. While he was cooling his heels in the house after a brotherly spat, absently playing his banjo. He was practicing Reuben, a train song, trying to create a fluid rolling sound that made the melody part of the rhythm. And then, it just happened. The first three-finger player that Earl heard on the radio was DeWitt Snuffy Jenkins on the Crazy Water Barn Dance radio show brought to you by Crazy Water Crystal's Patent Medicine. Snuffy played a version of a vaudeville hit called Dear Old Dixie that caught Earl's fancy. And a few years later, it was one of two songs that Earl played to impress Bill Monroe at his audition.
Before Earl, the five-string banjo seemed headed for extinction, and the banjo was widely seen as nothing more than a prop for a comedian. By 1946, the Gibson Company was only making five-string banjos on special order. But Earl changed all that. And so we come to another Big Bang moment in banjo history, that December night in 1945 when Earl made his debut performance with Monroe on the Grand Ole Opry. It was the banjo sound that would have excited Mark Twain all over again, music that came right home to you, suffused your system, and ramified your whole constitution. Overnight, the five-string banjo was rediscovered as a modern instrument, and everybody wanted to know how to play it Scruggs style. One of the important things to remember is that old-time string band music was dance music. The fiddle and banjo players would sit between two rooms and there were dancers in each room. Sometimes they played at the schoolhouse, but usually it was in their neighbors' homes. And the fiddle always led and the banjo was the rhythm. Bluegrass came along and it adopted some things from jazz, like each of the instruments could take solos. The banjo could take a break with the fiddle, the mandolin, and suddenly the guitar could take a break. And thanks to players like Earl and Don Reno, there were these new ways of playing. So basically, bluegrass developed as a concert music. It's not a dance music. Rather than a casual group of neighbors getting together to play familiar old songs, bluegrass values pre precision and professionalism. It also depends on microphone technology, recordings, and radio to reach its listeners. Radio superstations like WWVA from Wheeling, West Virginia beamed bluegrass across the country. In the late 1940s, a young Bostonian named Bill Keith used to tune in late at night and found his inspiration.
But he started playing plectrum banjo and then switched to the five string using Pete Seeger's manual. In 1963, he became the first northern banjo player that Bill Monroe asked to join the Bluegrass Boys. For Keith, the eureka moment came in 1960 when he heard a fiddle player from Nova Scotia playing Devil's Dream. Bill Keith really opened up the doors for a lot of progressive banjo playing. Even since the inception of bluegrass, there was a lot of progressive playing going on. Earl Scruggs himself was a very progressive player, and it was a very revolutionary thing to have heard him, even though he didn't invent the three-finger style. He was doing all sorts of innovative things. Uh, I had a chance to talk to him on a variety of occasions, and he mentioned to me that uh, when he was a little kid, he was into boogie-woogie music, and in particular a tune called Step It Up and Go which is a boogie woogie tune. And so when Earl first went into the studio, the very first time he ever was in a recording studio was to play with Bill Monroe right around 1947. The very first song he ever played in the studio was a song called Heavy Traffic Ahead with Bill Monroe. And the solo, it was a blues tune, and the solo he took was based on Step It Up and Go. Step it up and go. And maybe six or seven years later, when he had joined forces with Lester Flatt to form the Foggy Mountain Boys, they recorded a song for Columbia Records called Foggy Mountain Special, which was just kind of a formalization of this, uh, this blues boogie-woogie tune. So we're going to play just a little bit of Foggy Mountain Special for you. Thank you. 
Inspired in part by Bill Keith, New Yorkers Bela Fleck and Tony Trishka have consistently found new ways to invoke the banjo's historic associations while carrying its 200-year-old story into another millennium. They believe that there are no limits to what kind of music the banjo can play. Tony points to the Beatles, Miles Davis, and Aaron Copland as formative influences. <laughs> Your turn, Tony. <laughs> Let's see. What am I talking about here? This is, um... We want to let our fiddler get some... Yeah, we're going to, uh, we're going to feature Daryl right now. Daryl Anger. Let's have another hand for Daryl Anger for gracing our stage here. We used to be in a group, or perhaps we're still in a group, we're not sure, called Psychograss, which kind of says it all right there. <laughs> and uh, perhaps yeah. you'd like to uh, yeah. expound on Psychograss just yeah. a little bit. Yeah, Tony, Tony and I met uh, possibly in 1978 or 79 out here uh, on the East Coast. I was living in California and uh, came out here on a regular basis and uh, one of the things that most impressed me about Tony, I was a big fan of Tony's uh, Tony's first featured album that he made was a record called Bluegrass Light which definitely shed some kind of <laughs> different colored light on bluegrass 
featured uh, Andy Statman and some other folks and uh, uh, some of this stuff got me so excited that I, I would actually, uh, I was living in Santa Cruz at the time and I would actually drag people off the street, drag them upstairs and sit them down and make them listen to some of the, the cuts on, uh, especially a uh, version of uh, a tune called Remington Ride, which was a, I believe a Don Reno, was it a Don Reno tune? Herb Remington? Yeah. Don Reno tune, um, in which Tony had overdubbed at least three banjos playing parallel parts, uh, three frets apart. It was amazing. Plus, at least six saxophones also playing parallel parts <laughs> in uh, ascending minor thirds. It was amazing. So, uh, yeah. Uh, usually people tend to uh, associate experimentalism with uh, ineffability and delicacy and uh, Tony is, is a great exploder of that myth. He uh, <laughs> always, uh, his, his uh, soul power is so wonderful and I love playing with him, I'm always having, always will. So, uh, let's get to uh, the next tune which is a tune that I wrote uh, a few years back called Ride the Wild Turkey, which we performed with psychograss under the name Ride the Wild Brains. <laughs> Okay, I want to leave some time for questions, but uh, as I'm sure you have many at this point. Um, but I just want to thank you all for coming this evening. I also want to thank Pat Serkey and the Cambridge Forum for hosting this event. They deserve a round of applause, you all do, for having this. 
And uh, before we uh, before we go, I uh, also want to remind you the advice of Mark Twain uh, that when you want genuine music, just smash your pianos and invoke the glory beaming banjo. I give you now Tony Trishka, Daryl Anger, uh, our encore and a slight variation on a venerable Flat and Scruggs piece. It's called Doggy Salt. <laughs> Possibly we need context. Do we need context? It's just music, but uh, there is a great, very, very famous Flat and Scruggs piece which played at every bluegrass jam. It's required playing called Salty Dog Should Blues. Should I play that first? You can play a little bit of that, yeah. yeah. And you can okay. explain what the heck is going on with Doggy Salt. Okay, here's a little bit of Salty Dog. All right, that was a cheap shot. Uh, okay, that's Salty Dog, the chords being G, E, these are not the lyrics, A, D, G. By Tony, that's the chord progression that we talk about every day at the Berklee College of Music. <laughs> If I was going to the Berkeley College of Music, I would know that that's true, but I'm sure it is true. They have a little flag out front with that, those very chords <laughs> in that very order. Well, in a fit of inspiration and brilliance, if I may say so myself, I decided, what if I took those chords and played them backwards? Are those chords taught at the Berkeley College of Music? No. <laughs> They're not. <laughs> say. <laughs> it's all context. You know, so, Tony, you've just created a, a brand new monster here. <laughs> uh, almost impossible to play <laughs> these chords in this order. Very easy to play each chord by itself. <laughs> Slightly easy to play <laughs> the chords in the other order, the old order, the old order, <laughs> and now the new order. So instead of G E A D. Follow along, folks. It's G, D, A, E. And then as a bonus chord, I give you a C chord and the final D chord and back to G. Because we give and we just keep on giving. <laughs> okay. We will expend a little more testosterone for you folks right now. One, two, three.
Thanks a lot. <laughs> okay, that's our show tonight, and we're happy to take your questions now if you have any. Care to stay? Questions? Yeah. All right. Don't be shy. All right. I just got to know one thing. How do you know where to put your fingers? <laughs> well, I was wondering, were you, we had here in Boston for a couple of decades at least, one of the, the great banjo players, uh, Don Stover. Did you ever get to play with him or uh, learn anything from him? The, the question is, did I ever play with Don Stover, who played here at Hillbilly Ranch? Well, it's no longer here, but uh, uh, Hillbilly Ranch was a big bluegrass place through the 70s, maybe? Yeah, it's long gone, I guess. But uh, the Lilly Brothers and Tex Logan with Don Stover would play there. And uh, yeah, I, I interacted with Don Stover a number of times, did some workshops together, and learned a couple of his tunes and some of his licks. And he was sort of one of the purveyors of the melodic style before it was there. It had little snippets of it that Bill Keith expounded upon to some extent. Yeah. So you've given us an uh, excellent history of the banjo in the last several hundred years. What do you envision in the next 50 to 100 years? Boy, that's a really tough question. What's going to happen in the next 50 to 100 years? Uh, I, I mean, I think one trend that's happening now, and it's being played right out at uh, Berklee College of Music, is uh, the banjo is no longer just a bluegrass instrument or an old-time instrument. It's just a musical instrument, which is kind of what it's always been. I mean, just from what you're hearing now, tonight you're hearing this African-oriented music, you're hearing ragtime, you're hearing some jazz. So it's kind of always been there, even though people always associate the banjo with... So thanks to people like Bela Fleck, Noam Pakelny, and the Punch Brothers, uh, you know, Bela's done African albums, he's done classical, complete classical albums. Uh, so I think that's kind of the trend. And at Berkeley right now we have a wonderful banjo player named Wes Corbett, who's uh, a very modern player, but he can play bluegrass too, but he's kind of more of that next generation that's just playing music on the banjo and it's not necessarily bluegrass. Uh, I've been playing bluegrass, you know, playing Scruggs style for so long, it's, it's hard for me to break away from it sometimes, but uh, the new folks are just like playing anything. And I think that's where it's going without getting real specific, saying it's going to be exactly this, but it's just music. Thank you. Thanks. I, I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge John Lincoln Wright, who wrote the song, They Tore Down the Hillbilly Ranch, and who passed away a while ago. Um, oh, okay. And did a lot of great country um, singing. Um, a first question is, do either of you have anything to say about uh, Jim Queskin's Jug Band, uh, the closest thing to sort of popular music that I can think of here in the Boston area that is, m might be understood to be part of this tradition? And the other question I have on the eve of Mardi Gras is the place of New Orleans in the evolution of the, the, play, the, the role of the banjo, in particular, if you have anything to say about, I think it was named Danny Barker. Danny Barker, and, right. And, and also, possibly, um, early jazz after the ragtime phase, where the banjo, as I understand it, was an important um, uh, member of the uh, ensemble. Um, and if you had anything to say about that. And by the way, did you ever play that instrument tonight? The the one to your far left? This one? Yeah. Yes, I played oh, it okay, I missed right that. at the very beginning. I, I guess I missed that. Thank yeah, you. Sorry. Uh, Jim Question, do you want to handle that question? I'll answer the next one, or shall I... Did they have ever have a five-string banjo? They certainly. Or did Bill Keith play? Bill Keith them. played it. Yeah. yeah. Did he play? Plectrum? Did he play? Plectrum? Well, he, he, Bill Keith played a, a five-string banjo, but he took off the fifth string and he strummed it because he was originally a plectrum player back before he played bluegrass. And um, Bob Siggins, who was with the Charles, your very own personal Charles River Valley Boys, wonderful bluegrass group that did an album called Beetle Country, actually, on a major label, Electra Records, so all Beetle tunes done bluegrass style, with Joe Val, who was another wonderful Boston-based uh, mandolin player and wonderful singer. 
Um, anyway, I'm digressing or giving you the history of bluegrass in Boston. Um, but anyway, Bob Siggins and Bill Keith played with the Jim Quest and Jug Band, which was based here in Boston, and had Maria Moldauer and Jeff Moldauer and Fritz Richmond. I would Richmond. imagine at some point somebody will want to do a documentary or some kind of you know, history of the, the plectrum banjo, which is kind of a different instrument. Uh, but certainly has played a huge role in uh, you know American popular music throughout the uh, last couple centuries at least. Mm -hmm. you know, but uh, I guess we're kind of looking at the five string here, which is, is yeah. just got this unique quality of the extra string, which in a weird place. I mean, I, I should say that the banjo project itself envisioned encompassing the plectrum or the four string as well, uh, and does in uh, some of the elements that are on the website, uh, including performances by some amazing plectrum and tenor play players, uh, Cynthia Sayer, uh, Eddie Davis, um, and uh, Don Vappi, who's from New Orleans, and in fact, uh, he he actually appears in the uh, the PBS documentary as well. Um, and so to address your question about the New Orleans tradition, yeah, we didn't touch on that because it's primarily a four-string or six-string tradition. Uh, and uh, the, certainly the connection between, uh, or the through line uh, between uh, minstrelsy, the uh, ragtime era, and early jazz uh, can also also be traced with the development of, of syncopation, uh, which primarily came from the banjo. Uh, and certainly in the ragtime era, most of the uh, earliest recordings were, were actually banjo recordings of ragtime, not piano. Um, and in that era, they also developed uh, the four string so that it could be played in, uh, you know, in, in other keys, uh, in vaudeville houses and, and theaters, and a whole variety of different instruments. So that's a whole other tradition that we didn't cover here. Uh, but I would say it's, you know, it's another aspect of, of how uh, varied and rich the banjo's um, you know, sources are. All right, thanks very much. Any other questions? Okay. So, thank you, Mark Fields, Tony Trishka, Daryl Anger. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. You have been listening to a program of Cambridge Forum recorded in February 2013, co-sponsored by the First Parish in Cambridge, the Lowell Institute, and the Friends of Cambridge Forum. For a CD of this forum entitled The Banjo Project, featuring Tony Trishka, Daryl Anger, and Mark Fields, or for additional information about our ongoing radio series and our Forum Network webcasts, visit us on the web at cambridgeforum.org. In Harvard Square, I'm Pat Zerke. Thanks for joining us. Now, we have DVDs and CDs, in case you didn't get them at information. We have people who will sign them for you. And we have the answers to the banjo quiz, salmon-colored paper on your way out. Great.